Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Tyndall. I am executive director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture, where our mission is to foster curiosity and a spirit of discovery in visitors of all ages, enhancing public understanding of and appreciation for the natural world, science, and human cultures. This mission in mind, I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's lecture, Exploring Egypt's Middle Kingdom at the Site of Ancient Thebes, sponsored by the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East. We are delighted to have Dr. Antonio Morales with us tonight, who will discuss the archaeological, historical, and cultural research being conducted by his team in the ancient city of Thebes to better understand the city's role in the development of Egypt's classical age. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions anytime during the program. And our speaker will address as many as time allows at the end of the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Peter Dermanwellian, Barbara Bell Professor of Egyptology at Harvard University and Director of the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks very much, Brenda. Welcome to all of you joining us today, tonight, wherever you are. Tonight, we go back into the Middle Kingdom. This is the second of our three Egyptological lectures this uh, semester. The last, third and last one will be on Thursday, April 21. More on that a little bit later. But tonight, Antonio Morales is Assistant Professor of Egyptology in the Seminar of Ancient History at the University of Alcala. He's currently based here with us this semester, and perhaps a bit longer if we're lucky, in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations as our Real Colegio Complutense visiting professor. He obtained his PhD in Egyptology from the University of Pennsylvania in 2013. Then he was lecturer in Egyptology and research associate at the Freie Universität in Berlin, postdoctoral researcher at Heidelberg University and assistant researcher at Mainz University. Dr. Morales has participated in several expeditions to Egypt at, ready for this list, Abydos, Saqqara, Dra Abu El Naga, El Amra, Kobit El Hawa, and Der El Bahri. And he's currently the director of the Middle Kingdom Theban Project, a research initiative focusing on the documentation, study, and publication of tombs of the late 11th dynasty and early Middle Kingdom in the cemeteries of Der El Bahri and Asasif at Thebes, that's the West Bank of modern Luxor. He's published numerous articles in scholarly journals and contributions to Egyptological monographs. In 2001, he edited a volume on beer in the ancient world. And in 2011, he co-edited a book on kingship. More recently, he completed a monograph on the pyramid texts dealing with the goddess Nut, published in 2017. And just last year, he co-edited a volume on Middle Kingdom Archaeology, History, and Culture, published in our very own Harvard Egyptological Studies, or HES monograph series, which I am delighted to report in a shameless plug is now up to volume 15 and counting. Please join me in welcoming Antonio Morales, and especially tonight, since he's a bit under the weather, so he gets extra points for joining us nonetheless. So tonight, exploring Egypt's Middle Kingdom, at the site of ancient Thebes. Antonio, the virtual microphone is yours. Thank you, Peter, for your lovely introduction. And thank you everyone for attending this online event today. First of all, uh, obviously I would like to thank the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture and the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East for their kind invitation to present the results of our work in Egypt in this event. My talk, therefore, um, will deal with the works of the University of Alcala expedition and its Middle Kingdom Theban project in the site of ancient Thebes, modern Luxor, um, where we have been working for the last six seasons in between April uh, 2015 and December 2021. Let me see if we can start with the first slide. Um, <clears throat> almost 100 years have passed in between this photograph that you can see in the screen taken by one of our archaeologists in April 2017 
And this, another uh, photograph that was taken by the photographer of the Metropolitan Museum of Art expedition at Thieves, led by Herbert Winlock in December 1922. These two photographs, the color one, the white and the black and white photograph that you have just seen and you see in your screen, allow, allow me to discuss questions that have to do with the ways we interpret a site in different times by different teams uh, and also through different methodologies and different theoretical approaches. And this is something that we are going to see today in my talk. Uh, but first of all, I would like to, this is something that I usually do at the beginning of my talk, I would like to thank again all the um, uh, agencies and groups that are supporting our work in Egypt uh, in these two areas that you will see uh, mentioned often today as a Sif and Deir bahari in the area of the necropolis of Thebes, as I said before. Uh, together with regional and national uh, agencies, uh, we have private foundations, the University of Alcala and the Spanish Association of Egyptology, which help us to develop and to carry on the work that you are going to uh, witness today. And of course, if anyone wants to see more details, want to know more about our project in terms of photographs, summaries, discussions, um, uh, research papers, uh, tables, um, you will be able to find them in all our social media where you will be, um, uh, you are welcome to uh, see all the materials. We also publish a couple of uh, research papers, one of them in Spanish, in the so-called Boletín de la Asociación Española de Egyptología, um, published by the Spanish Association of Egyptology, and we also usually get uh, one uh, report, yearly report, in the uh, Egyptological German Journal, journal Estudien sur el Tegetitian Kultur, where we publish in extens extensively the, this, the results of that particular year. Of course, what we are going to see today is the result of the work of around 50 uh, researchers, uh, which, as it happens with all the research teams in the 21st century, combine all kinds of uh, approaches, methodologies, disciplines, expertise, experiences, and um, knowledge of technologies and capacities, which uh, somehow allow us to get more precise information, more um, also more complete data from the findings in the archaeological site. Uh, here you see people that represent archaeology, epigraphy, philology, ceramics, restoration and conservation, physical anthropology, topography, architecture, Egyptology, 3D, photography. We have all kinds of approaches and methodologies for discussing, for dealing with the materials we find in Egypt. And obviously, something very important is the support and the permission of the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, which is actually the one that allows us to continue excavations in Egypt in a collaborative uh, initiative that, as you can see through the different photographs of our previous seasons, have had really happy uh, results and, and experiences for all of us. So, we start for those who want to know more about the location of the site in the area of ancient Thebes, which is uh, situated around 700 kilometers to the south of modern Cairo. Uh, in that center, Thebes, uh, famous for usually the New Kingdom uh, antiquities, we are going to focus on the West Bank in that um, a photograph, you can see the river, the Nile River and the green agricultural area together with the uh, desert where basically most of the funerary temples and cemeteries are located. 
in that area, in that specific rectangle that you see in the screen, is where we are going to focus today, since this is this area that uh, presents the main two cemeteries of our interest. Basically, as I said before at the beginning of my talk, Asasif and Deir Bahari. Asasif is mainly the um, flat area that you see in the center of the photograph, and Deir Bahari is basically all these northern uh, section hill here in this area, together with these um, semi-circus section uh, where the two temples, the famous temple of Hatshepsut, which did not exist by the time uh, of our um, the, the, the officials and the king Mentuhotep that we are interested on existed. So the story of excavations in this site start probably before even Winglock, but we can say that it is Herbert Winglock, the one that you see uh, to the right, uh, who directed the main excavations in these uh, tombs from two particular periods, the late 11th dynasty and the early 12th dynasty. We will see that in a moment. Winglock um, excavate, started excavating in the area in 1919, and for the next two, three years, he continued excavating all these uh, tombs in order to get information to, and this is the main point of his expedition, to reconstruct the history of the Middle Kingdom. Uh, this Middle Kingdom is considered, uh, as Brenda mentioned at the beginning of um, her presentation, uh, the classical period of pharaonic history. So, um, Winlock was basically behind all kinds of data that could allow him to understand a period called the first intermediate period, where we got two opposite powers, the Heracleopolitan rule in the north and the Theban rule in the south, uh, who were trying to, together with other provinces, um, in a moment of fragment, political fragmentation and lack of a central power and a king who could control the whole country, they were trying to fight for their resources, the territory and power. Uh, it is by the end of that period that it happens the so-called reunification, which basically means that one specific uh, power, basically the Theban rule, through the hands of the king Mentuhotep II, will reunify the country, conquer the rest of the territories, and give um, um, open, let's say, a new era, starting with the end of the 11th dynasty, with his reign, uh, starting with Mentuhotep II, as uh, the king who opened the time for the formation of the so-called Middle Kingdom. Uh, by, the, by the time um, Mentuhotep the fourth, sorry, there is a minor mistake here. By the time Mentuhotep the fourth uh, end his reign, we will see how his vizier Amenemhat, probably his vizier Amenemhat, will become the first king of the 12th dynasty. And what you see in this map basically is the green section uh, with the Thebes as a center, uh, expanding to the south against this power of three provinces in Hierakonpolis, Etfu and Elephantine, and later, once they have controlled that area, will expand to the north against Dendera, Tainis, Abydos, and then the Heracleopolitan center in the north. So basically, in my talk today, we are going to discuss the some of the tombs that we have located uh, since the time of Winglock, actually, who already found uh, found them and excavated partially, we will discuss some of the, these tombs and the officials who own these tombs. And mainly, they did it. Uh, they built their tombs under the reigns of these two kings that you see in the screen. On the one hand, king, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Nephthepet Re, Sam of Ra, these are the typical titles, uh, part of the titulature, official titulature of a king of a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, Mentuhotep II. And on the other hand, the king of Egypt, Amenemhat I. Actually, because we usually, uh, we actually excavate five uh, areas, uh, different areas we will see in a moment in the cemetery, <clears throat> we will focus today on basically two of these officials, <clears throat> the royal steward Henenu 
and the vizier Ibi. The first one, Henenu, uh, paid services to Mentuhotep II, while Ipi belongs to the beginning of the 12th dynasty and he served Kim Amenemhat I. The other two individuals that we saw in the screen a moment ago, Dagi and Jari, we will not talk much about them, but they are basically also important officials of the period. And in general, we believe that all these officials that we are mentioning today are the real ar architect architects of a new era. So we will start by saying that by the time of the pre-reunification, uh, most of the high officials were basically burying themselves in the area of El Tarif, where the beginning of our red dot line starts. Actually, by the time we get the reunification, Mentuhotep II will build a, a tomb in the area, a temple and a tomb in the area of Deir el Bahari, getting the attention of the officials that will move to that area. Here we have examples of the El Tarif uh, typical tombs, where we have these huge courtyards with an entrance chapel, very important for what we will see later in the tombs that we have been excavating in the last six seasons. And uh, basically this entrance chapel gave um, lead to the courtyard where you found uh, the different, um, these kinds of accesses, chapels to different, um, for the development of the mortuary cult of different individuals and the main entrance into the tomb of the owner, the main owner of the tomb. We will see how these kinds of tombs will have an effect on the types or categories of tombs that we will see later in the area of Deir el-Bahari. The main idea is that once Mentuhotep II got the re reunified the country and got the capacity to uh, re, uh, refresh the cultural and the uh, technological and the social and political movements of the country, he created his own temple and tomb in an area where somehow he was looking for not only Mm, connecting himself with his ancestors in a different place, however, but also uh, creating a, rich, a new ritual landscape that has his own persona as a center for the area. What you see in the screen now is basically three main areas of our interest. It doesn't mean all these areas and all these tombs are included in our concession, Basically, the ones that you see in brownish color, like TT-103 or TT-366 here in the middle of Asasif, in the Asasif platform, they belong to our concession together with the three ones that you see in the Northern Hills. But it basically tell us different areas of a necropolis where different kind of people, we are talking about social topography, they were buried. Not only is a question of social topography, but also a question of different kinds of titles and different kinds of offices or, or appointments that they got, which allow them to be buried in different areas of the site. And that help us to understand more about the society of the period. That's why in our project, in the Middle Kingdom Theban project, we aim at excavating several tombs at the same time, not basically one single monument, uh, even if that requires much funding and somehow more headaches for the organization of the uh, yearly work in Egypt. Mainly, this area that we see here of the Asasif Plain belongs to those who uh, were basically buried uh, uh, in front of the initial construction of the Temple of Mentuhotep II here in the mountain. Um, they are usually earlier uh, in time, which means that basically they were, they belong to the initial stages of the reconstruction of the, of, sorry, of the fight for the re reunification of the country. Meantime, those officials who live under the king by the time he reunified the country and were uh, able to support and help contribute to the construction of this new era are basically buried in this area uh, in the northern hills of Deir el-Bahari. And finally, and this is something we are still testing, some of the um, 
um, not so prestigious officials who could not uh, attain uh, a better place near the king, near his complex in this area, they have to be buried uh, away from the king. So basically, here you have now a much more detailed uh, specification or locations of the different officials that uh, whose tombs we are excavating. In the northern hills, you have the tombs of Henenu, uh, tomb is called Titi, Theban tomb, 313, Metropolitan Museum of Art 510. This is the two numbering systems that we are using, the one that the Met used uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and the one that we gave later. Then we have the tomb of the Vizier EP, uh, TT315, and we have the tomb E1, which has been excavated intensively in the last year, still is not finished, and uh, whose uh, owner is still unknown. And in the platform of Asasif, we have the famous and powerful Vizier Dagi uh, under the reign of Mentuhotep II and Jari, far, farther away than Dagi, and therefore also showing uh, titles that were not as prestigious or as definitely important in the political system of the period as Dagi. Uh, he was supervisor of the prison, a prison complex. So that's basically the distribution of the five tombs that we are excavating at this point in Deir al-Bahari and Asasif. And now what we are going to do is to focus on two of them and on the findings and the progress of the work we have been uh, carry, carrying out for the last six years. This is a view of the Northern Hills um, of Deir al-Bahari. You can see clearly um, a pattern, which is basically, we can look at these two tombs uh, to the left side of the photograph, where you have huge rectangular courtyard excavated or prepared in the, um, in the, as a ramp to approach the entrance into the still public area inside the tomb where there was usually a public section for visitors, for priests, for relatives, for friends who could attend and approach the deceased, usually in the, in the form of a statue or a stila inside of each of these rock cut tombs in the area. Interestingly, and this is why before I was making emphasis, putting emphasis on this question, at the lower section of these complexes, usually at the feet of the hill, we find a chapel, an entrance chapel, somehow repeating the kind of patterns that we saw in the cemetery of El Tarif, the ancestors of all these officials. And here you have the main area of work um, in this section of the cemetery, the tomb of Henenu, TT313, the tomb of EP315, and a what we call the Eastern section, where we have several tombs, but by now we are focusing on tomb E1, called uh, by Herbert Winlock, Metropolitan Museum of Art 521. Um, the first of these tombs that we are going to see today is the tomb of the Royal Steward Henenu. Uh, as I said before, TT, Theban tomb, 313. Um, one important aspect of these tombs, as I said before, is that they reproduce the type of construction that we saw in El Tarif, uh, that we saw in this cemetery of the ancestors of these officials. Obviously, if we go back a couple of slides, you see that the position of Henenu here in this, plan, in this map here is in connection with uh, here you only have part of the section with the, um, here the Henenu tomb, it's in connection with the complex of the King uh, Mentuhotep, which actually uh, tell us a lot about the date and the uh, aims of the officials at this point. Even if some of the officials uh, use a different kind of uh, tomb architecture, uh, mainly in the platform of Asasif, these officials are going to take <clears throat> the previous patterns that we saw in El Tarif and reuse it here. In the case of the Royal Steward uh, uh, Henenu, 
we have an interesting aspect that we have seen uh, actually unparalleled in other tombs. And if someone knows of a parallel uh, to this aspect that I'm going to mention now, we will be very happy to get the information, which is basically these kinds of steps as wide as the courtyard that welcome and help to approach for the approach of the visitors into the tomb. This aspect, these kinds of huge open uh, uh, steps, and actually when we cleaned them and went the day that we finished cleaning them and went away um, because they are excavated in the limestone rock, with each, which is very whitish, they really shine and the aspect when they were in very good condition many thousands of years ago must have been impressive. Now, we focus basically uh, these last uh, six years on the inside and the outside of the, of the tomb. Uh, here you have the plans that our topographers and architects have prepared, including uh, a very particular tomb with a long corridor, several halls, um, side chambers, including seven shafts with chambers at the bottom of them and uh, different sections where we think that Henenu created two different burial or sarcophagus chambers, perhaps two uh, confused uh, uh, tomb robbers and make them believe that the main chamber was the one they found, although there was a second one behind. We will see that in a moment. Here you have the excavation of the uh, outside. Basically, uh, we have one of our inspectors supervising the work we are doing in one of the squares. And we are going to focus actually on the shaft um, that show up close to the facade of the tomb um, some years ago, which we excavated, re-excavated um, this previous 2020. You see in the plan where this shaft is marked is basically um, a, a two or three meters down shaft that, con that leads to a chamber that after cleaning, that's the aspect. We have to say that most of these shafts were constructed in later times. They do not belong to the Middle Kingdom. They do not follow Middle Kingdom typical um, burials. And even the findings, which have been much removed over the time, um, and they were very fragmentary, show most of the times that they belong to the late period or even Ptolemaic times. Here you have another of these shafts, shaft 7A, which you can reach through room 6D here. Then you arrive to this section of the shaft, you can descend through the shaft, and here you have the aspect that this room has. Then we go into the corridor, and this is very important because, as I said before, it seems that Henenu, as we will see Ipi did, uh, the Vizier Ipi also did, try to play, perhaps being afraid of, of tomb robbers, with the idea of, um, you know, uh, presenting a sarcophagus chamber that is actually a fake sarcophagus chamber, hiding the real one behind. This is something that somehow, in many ways, ancient Egyptians through technology, through knowledge, and through the um, capacity to hide these kinds of um, private sections of the tombs, which are not the public. What we see is the public area. These private sections are different and they were not um, open or accessible. Here you have the second section of this very, very long rock tomb into the mountain that take us into hole number two. We will see in a moment uh, these different sections. Then we go into hole number one. We keep uh, progressing. Something very interesting, and that's why I bring another tomb of the time of the uh, 11th dynasty, the tomb of Dagi. This recess that you see in the two sides of the corridor of Dagi also show up this kind of research in the hole, in this hole of Henenu, which tell us that we need to continue making, conducting research on parallels, looking for the functions of these um, sections, architectural aspects or features of the tomb. 
and then we reach the bottom, the rear rear part of the tomb where shaft one was also documented, excavated, clean, and photographed. Now, as for the outside, we were excavating the upper courtyard, the upper section of the courtyard, and we have been able, as I said before, you can see here, to find these interesting steps and parallel feature uh, not found in any other tomb in the area. However, here perhaps you can see the beginning of it. Um, we started finding a kind of a structure of limestone that has like a passage in between that uh, didn't show, uh, didn't present any material at all. Um, perhaps um, not, I don't bring any other photograph, but in the middle, you have a section without limestone. These two sections were finally uh, clean at the end of 2021 uh, season. And we found these two uh, kinds of like walls that perhaps um, limited the sacred, the most or the most sacred area of the courtyard. Here you have an example of the groups of uh, workers that um, are the real, um, the real uh, protagonist of our story because they are really the ones, uh, not only that really make the physical work, but also the ones that, that have the knowledge to suggest and to orient or even to remark the best ways to approach different problems in the site, the excavations, and even um, the findings that we do over the years. We also have the question of the um, epigraphy. We have found hundreds of fragments of uh, what seems to be a stila on the one hand and sarcophagi on the other. We have been able to um, recover uh, around 600 fragments with hieroglyphs, um, also cursive hieroglyphs. And that indicates, um, or I would say, through the analysis of the type of stone, the types of hieroglyphs, the style of the inscriptions, and the type of writing, uh, hieroglyphs or cursive hieroglyph, carved or uh, painted, we have been able to, to define or to discern or to distinguish, as I said before, probably four stila. And these four stila were probably erected on the main corridor of the tomb and two sarcophagi. And this idea of the two sarcophagi goes very well with our uh, consideration of the existence of two possible sarcophagus uh, chambers who could have played very distinctive roles, one of them as a fake chamber, the other one as a real chamber. Here we have two of the epigraphers working on the um, playing with the fragments, as you can see here, different types of fragments with different kinds of inscriptions, styles, patterns, colors that allow us to distinguish, as I said, four stile and two sarcophagi. In addition, we know of one stila in the Museum of St. Petersburg in Russia that seems to have um, um, originated in the entrance chapel of Henin. If you remember, we haven't yet uh, excavated the lower section of our courtyards, but if you remember, I told you that in El Tarif, you have these kinds of entrance chapels that we seem to find also in the tombs of Deir el Bahari. And it is in one of these entrance chapels, specifically in the one of Henenu, that by 1910 or 1911, Howard Carter, famous for the precisely well-celebrated this year uh, discovery of Tutankhamun, uh, recovered this stila and for, for unknown reasons, it ended up in the museum in Russia. We will also work with this stila and the inscription because it can offer much det many details about Henenu. And here you have a reconstruction of the position of the four stila and the two sarcophagi that we think Henenu used in his tomb. On the one hand, in this section of the near hole two and hole one, he will use what seems to be a limestone pink sarcophagus. And then 
if we continue into the deeper section of the tomb, we will find a whitish limestone sarcophagus. To be honest, although we love both sarcophagi, uh, the fragments from both sarcophagi, it is true that in terms of style, precision, um, the capacity to, to, re, to um, retrieve important information from these um, uh, inscriptions, we can say clearly that the pink sarcophagus is somehow not as delicate as the white sarcophagus. The inscriptions in the white sarcophagus are more, much more careful, better uh, uh, drawn or written. Uh, the decoration is much more colorful and the artistic precision or um, delicatesse, we could say, is really much, much more precise in the white sarcophagus than in the pink one. And then the stila, which actually uh, the few fragments that we have seems to show that they offer uh, important biographical information about the deceased. It is very important for them to show what they did in life. But imagine how important it is for archaeologists to recover all that data. We have fragments from Henenu where he mentions that he was sent by the king Mentuhotep II in an expedition to trade and to deal with materials that they needed. So all these questions are absolutely necessary for the reconstruction of the uh, tomb. Um, and then we jumped to, in this second part of my talk, to the tomb of the vizier Ipi. The tomb of the vizier Ipi, if you remember our plan of the northern hills, was to the east of the tomb of Henenu, and we are dealing here with um, the tomb of a vizier who came several years later and served King Amenemhat I, the first king of the 12th dynasty. An important uh, part of the work we have done in the last uh, season was basically this middle courtyard, middle section of the courtyard that you see here in the main in the main uh, section of the photograph. And in the background, you can see the upper section of the courtyard where we have now our haimas or tents and the entrance into the rock cut tomb of Ipi. Very important also is the work we have been carrying out in the uh, eastern section of the tomb, in this side of the tomb where we have subsidiary chambers and subsidiary uh, spaces that we will see in a moment of really uh, much uh, interest for us. Here you have, as you see in the plan, a section marked in yellow um, corresponding with this area, this eastern wall of the courtyard, where we see all these entrances into different spaces that we will see in a moment. One of them was uh, here you see um, under this section on the wall, under, under it, you see here in a small section is the opening of a shaft that took us into the uh, famous first uh, photographs that I was showing you, the mummification deposit of the Vizier Ipi. Herbert Winlock found this in December 1922, including all these jars, wooden beams, nets, and some uh, small amulets and items. But for some reason that we do not know, although we have checked all his diaries, he left most of it inside the shaft and never took it to the museums. As I said before, at the beginning of my talk in April 2017, one of our archeologists, Mohammed Osman, he found, he, we could say he rediscovered the mummification deposit or what he left, Herbert Winlock left in the mummification deposit of uh, EP. The mummification deposit of, her, of, of EP uh, found by Herbert Willock and rediscovered by us in 2017 included 56 jars of many different types which are being studied by our experts on ceramics. But it also included inside of them all the mummification materials, everything necessary for the embalming of the Vizier Ipi. 
here you have some of the stoppers of these jars, which actually they, they in order to really encapsulate the stopper well, it was usually um, used together with textile. And we have uh, natron bags, textile bags full of natron powder, which is the natron, which is the material necessary to dry, to dehydrate the body of the deceased and some other materials like this one, which has been interpreted as the base for some of these jars. Our expert on textile, um, Elsa Ivanians, she joined us last year for first time. And we are very happy to count with her on the team because she has been able to develop a huge analysis, a huge database where she analyzed and she recovered all the data to analyze these kinds of um, textiles, bandages, wrappings, shrouds, all kinds of materials that will allow us to understand not only questions of mummification, but also questions of textile production. And here, one specific object, and we have received permission by the Ministry of Antiquities to show it to you. Um, one specific object that was included in one of the, mummy, of the jars found in the mummification deposit, probably because the priests, the embalmers working with the objects, thought that we were dealing, that they were dealing with the natron bag. However, by mistake, what they were putting into one of the jars was the mummified heart of the Vizier Ipi, a human organ that was included in, by mistake, probably into the embalming cachet instead of taking the heart and putting it back into the chest of the mummy before it was, the embalming process was completed. In addition, we continue excavating all the other areas. We found, um, we cleaned the area where Herbert Winlock found the famous letters of Hekanakt. These papyri are famous because they really represent, um, they are letters and they really represent writings where you can see social, even family issues, even economic issues, renting, payments. Um, buying, selling, even, as I said before, social questions within the family or the household, a typical household from Thebes at that time. But this year we went down the hill and beyond this um, subsidiary chamber where, where Herbert Winlock found the famous uh, letters of Ekanakte, uh, we continue excavating the middle courtyard and we found, of course, several materials that remind us that these complexes were used not only for the burial of the deceased, but also for economic issues and trading and some other issues, including the reuse of these complexes by people who came later and built their own tombs. Here you have some of these chapters, including here we have this is small figurine of the god Bess. This is small um, shaptis that represent servants for the deceased. And they were very typical from later times, not from the Middle Kingdom, which actually evidenced the reuse. And we also found papyri, specifically um, papyri that was folded. And we are still working on the reconstruction of the different fragments, which we uh, hope to be able to translate, to see what kind of a small letter or a small message, uh, or perhaps part of an official document is a very small section uh, we'll, we will get. And as I said, finally, we focus on the lower section where we found a, another, you see here the entrance uh, block in the previous year in 2020, which was the last time we were there. We were, and then in 2021, we open excavated the internal, the, that section of this subsidiary uh, uh, construction where we found basically a limestone block as a threshold and actually a deposit with a garland and bouquet of flowers, probably from later times, not Middle Kingdom and some other objects connected to it. Here you have the cleaning of the garland by one of our conservators this fantastic garland which was deposited in front of the threshold of this subsidiary chamber and the bouquet of flowers and i will say uh, we have to admire the technology and the capacity to prepare something so delicate and the 
also I will emphasize the capacity of the Egyptian uh, environment to preserve things for us. Um, we hope this year we will have the opportunity to have with us um, an expert on um, flowers and plants that will be able to study this in detail. We also found a ceiling. We hope to be able to, we are working on the trans transcription and translation of the ceiling. And because it's the only written uh, evidence, piece of evidence we have found from this subsidiary chamber. And we also found the remains of crocodile skin, which is interesting and tell us new things about rituals in the period. Precisely another Spanish project working in uh, Kubet el Hawa in the south of Egypt has found several full crocodiles. We, we get closer, we get closer. We got at least the skin, uh, full crocodiles. And this is a question that is now under study to estimate which, what kind of function these crocodiles got located in front or deposited in front of a tomb. The inside of the tomb of E.P. also presents some secrets. First of all, here you have a long corridor, a shaft that goes into a tomb, a, 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 a space, a chamber where probably they got some wooden models. And then the public section where people could see the statue or the stila of the deceased. But it is under the floor of this section where the secret uh, part of the tomb was hidden for the buried of the Vizier EP. Under the floor of this square, squarish uh, room, it's called the mortuary cult room where people came to connect with the deceased. Under the floor of that is where they, hide, they hid the entrance into the sarcophagus chamber. Even something more interesting, the sarcophagus chamber was excavated in a way that they could create, this is the only block we have in position, they could create a floor on top of the sarcophagus and the canopic jar uh, box, a box for the four canopic jars where the organs of the disease removed in the process of mummification were deposited. The floor was covering completely the sarcophagus and the canopic jar box, which will allow, uh, the uh, will probably produce a sense of someone already came and stole everything when tomb robbers accessed this section. Here we have one of our epigraphers working on the translation of the text. We are using all kinds of technologies, including infrared and ultraviolet um, uh, photography for the most more precise uh, work with the translation and the identification of the decoration, iconography, and text. And finally, I don't have much time for it, but I will only mention that we have still three more tombs that we have been working with. One of them is the tomb E1 to the east of the other two that we have seen today. It is um, a tomb that uh, of which we don't know the owner. Uh, we have been working on it. Uh, we have cleaned the entrance and the other two tombs to the south of the Northern Hills. Now we are looking to the south instead of to the north. We are now in the Southern area in the platform where we have the tombs of Dagi on the one hand, one very important, very prestigious individual, judge, vizier, and as you can see in the list, a very long list of titles that made him one of the most important persons under King Mentuhotep II in the process of the reunification, and then the tomb of the supervisor of the prison complex, Jari, who was buried farther away than Dagi. And with this, I thank you for your attention. I hope I have not really gone so quickly. I would love to have had more time to discuss some things in detail. And I hope that my voice allow you to uh, hear and listen well all these uh, experiences and works that we have developed in the last six years um, in the name of the University of Alcala and its Middle Kingdom Theban project. Thank you very much. <laughs>